Greetings. My name is Kevin Reggett, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. Here on this channel, we cover topics and issues myself and others of various ages, races, and backgrounds engage in while in the summer. Many of the individuals connected with us are passionate about discussing real life issues, and I do so from a Christian biblical perspective. Our goal is to provide a platform where we can engage in open and honest conversations about topics that are relevant to our daily lives. And I believe that by sharing our experiences and insights, we can not only learn from one another, but also grow in our faith and understanding of God's word. Now, I invite you to these conversations and to be a part of our growing community. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you'll never miss a conversation. Today's conversation addresses uh, part two of from what we started last week, the power of thought or thinking or right thinking, excuse me. So let's jump in the car and let's ride. We're going to begin by really uh, looking at uh, Romans chapter eight, verses six through eight. And it states, now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit is death. Death that comprises all of the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul, peace, both now and forever. That is because the mind of the flesh with its cardinal thoughts and purposes is hostile to God, for it does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So when those who are living the life of the flesh, catering to the appetites and impulses of their cardinal nature, cannot please or satisfy God or be acceptable to him. Leading Christian author A.W. Tozar wrote, what we think about when we are free to think about what we will, that is what we are or will soon become. The Bible has a great deal to say about our thoughts. The reason the Bible says so much is that our thoughts are so vitally important to us. Our voluntary thoughts not only reveal who we are, they predict what we will become. And except for that conduct which springs from our basic natural instinct, all conscious behavior is preceded by and arises out of our thought and thought processes. Not only do we need to correct our thoughts, but we must also go further and actually crucify the old natural mind and receive an entirely new mind in Christ. The sanctification of the spirit is not the improvement of the old natural spirit, but a renouncing of it and the receiving of God's Holy Spirit instead. So the sanctification of our mind must be just as radical. We must recognize that our natural mind, our natural way of, of thinking uh, uh, after sin in the garden is wrong and must be laid totally down and we receive the mind of Christ instead. The ability to think and have powerful thoughts is a gift from God. But like so many other gifts we have from God, the forces of darkness can manipulate them to become negative as opposed to its original intent, which is to be positive. Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 to 17 states, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Every human being requires some degree of training and development in our functions and abilities from walking and speaking to reasoning and calculating. 
often this training, development, and testing appears in our lives through challenges, problems, and conflicts. When God placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the Garden of Eden, he was setting the stage for conflict for Adam and Eve. This conflict was taking place in their minds. Adam and Eve rejected God's word in favor of the serpent's counsel first in their minds and their thinking. Then they acted upon their thinking and they advanced to committing personal sins of the highest treason. And in doing so, Adam and Eve failed their first and, and only really significant moral test. In addition, God wanted to see Adam function not only in his ability to rule and subdue his outer environment, but also the inner environment of his soul, his intellect, will, and emotions. Free will gives us, as it did Adam, the ability to choose to obey or not. So God places a tree in the middle of Adam's subdivision and instructs him not to touch it and tells him why. This allows Adam to practice ruling over his free will and engaging in right thinking. Information, be it good or bad, forms thinking patterns that can govern how we act and react in life. Those of us who are married entered it with different mindsets based on information provided, gathered, and taught to us. How we function in our marriage stems from those thought patterns that we develop from that information. For example, and I'm going to share some information with you now regarding marriage. And I want you to pay attention to how current thoughts are challenged or new thoughts are developed. Okay, here we go. In studying chapter 10 of Genesis, I mean, excuse me, in studying chapter 1 of Genesis, you'll see that everything God declared was good had the ability to produce and sustain life or light. Now, this is also true of God's gift of a woman. Inside of her is good, or life, or light, that a man needs. That's why Proverbs declares, if any man finds a wife, he finds good. The word thing was added in later translations. The Hebrew word translated find means to discover something valuable. This suggests a process of unearthing, uncovering, and discovering. The problem today is we are not discerning or thinking right concerning this process God instituted. Remember what Proverbs said, the wise man Solomon pinned down? He said, if any man finds a wife, he finds good. You will never find anything you're not looking for. And most men have not been conditioned to look inside or examine the soul of a woman. Our focus has been external, and that's how we've been uh, uh, developed or trained or influenced to do. Therefore, men are marrying women who have another man's wife inside of them. And soon, the two become frustrated because the helper in her, the wife, is not being discovered or unearthed because there is no discerning of her. And therefore, she is not activated because there is no recognition of her Adam's voice. Where am I getting this from? Well, the first thing Eve received from Adam was the sound of his voice and a declaration of who she was to him. In Genesis 2, 22, 23, it says, Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. Adam called God's gift woman, a wombed man, because she had a womb. 
The only way Adam knew Eve had a wound was by discerning her makeup, her nature. The reason why the sound of Adam's voice is important is because all sound is a form of energy. Energy is the capacity or power to do something by the application of force. The sound of Adam's declaration, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man activated the wife and the woman to start coming forth, the helper that he needed. In this, men, we see that we have been misinformed and disinformed on the concept of rapping. <laughs> now, long before this term was injected into the music industry, it was the term used by many men uh, mainly probably African-American men, to refer to engaging in conversation with the female to develop an intimate relationship. And to be honest, most of this conversation involved lying and boasting about ourselves and our outward attraction to her. This is not the unearthing intended by God. But let's move on. Now, uh, uh, as I suggested, just, just track your thinking pattern now and see if any changes have taken place or any challenges have taken place provided uh, uh, with this information that I just given, given you from scripture. Now, in part one, I talked about high level thinking. What is termed high level thinking does not always equate to right thinking. Our soul is fed information from our five senses. Our souls interpret the information and makes decisions accordingly. That's the information, I mean, the exercise I just engaged us in. Now, if the diet of our souls only consists of happy meals from the McDonald's of life, we're in serious trouble. We're not getting all the information or nutrients we need to think right. And this type of diet makes us overweight and cardinal and erroneous thinking. And the more cardinal minded we are, the more power we give our flesh. Our minds must be able to receive information from the Holy Spirit because it is the overwhelming information we receive in our minds that convince us to do the things that we do or the things we don't do. So higher level thinking fueled by wrong information will lead to higher level wrong thinking. And therefore, we must be vigilant in our uh, mental eating habits and yielding to the Holy Spirit. Right thinking prevents us from grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit has to do with our character. It is a result of when our character is out of alignment with God. Quenching the Holy Spirit has to do with power. The word quenching means to choke off the flow. So quenching comes when we cut off the flow of the power of God in our lives, our ministry and our witnessing. It is cutting off where God is present and working through the Holy Spirit and replacing it with our presence and our work. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 14 out of the New Living Translation says, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things. Another key to thinking right is the source of our information, as I mentioned earlier the search and acceptance of truth and the ability to shift through the flow of disinformation and misinformation is critical. And there is a difference between the two. Disinformation is false or misleading information that is spread deliberately to deceive. Misinformation is false or inaccurate information that is communicated regardless of an intent to deceive 
or not. Let's move on. Consider this. We are granite life that is contingent upon shifting. We are ambassadors of an embassy, a church that is shifting on the earth. The body of Christ is shifting. We live in a nation that is shifting. And our process of listening may need a shifting along with our thinking. The fact that most of us are not trained or conditioned to consider the rewards or consequences of our thought processing, <coughs> excuse me, right thinking allows us to get real with what's going on inside our heads, dealing with it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and, the, and start living our true identity in Christ. And regardless uh, 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 of what else is going on in our lives, we need to take the time to examine what it is that is flowing through our minds and out of our minds to our uh, 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 thought processes and to our tongue that we declare and decree things from our uh, uh, mental mindset that are uh, uh, disconnected from God and not in connection and flowing with his will, desire, and way for us. You know, recently, uh, uh, just a sidebar note, uh, recently, during a family discussion, uh, the topic of interrupting one another while speaking came up. Because often my family, my wife, my two sons, uh, do that. And sometimes I engage in it too, to be honest. But one of my sons stated in, in our discussion that disrupting is, in conversation is normal. My wife agreed, but she grew up in a large family that interrupted each other all of the time. I didn't grow up in that type of environment, and, and I don't think it's normal. Now, it does occur in casual conversations, of course, but what we need to look at is what's behind the interruptions. Compulsive interrupting can be a sneaky manifestation of pride, especially for people who have quick minds and, and, and think on their feet quickly. And their thought processes are really more about uh, uh, defending their position than listening. Now, something another person says may trigger a thought in their head. And instead of patiently waiting to see if an opportunity might come up to express that thought, a prideful person will act on impulse and cut the other person off because he or she, consciously or unconsciously, is convinced that the thought they have simply cannot wait. See, when you do that, you are uh, uh, subliminally telling the other person that your thought is more important right now than anything else they have to say. Humble people don't do that. They esteem others more highly than themselves and, and that includes their thoughts, their ideals, their opinions. Just a side note to end our discussion today. What say you? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the ride today. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation. Otherwise, thank you for spending some of your time with me. Please take a second to like, share this post with your family and friends, subscribe to this channel, and as always, peace and blessings to you and your household.